Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Good evening and welcome to the regular meeting of Villa Park City Council. Everybody call the meeting to order. Don, will you please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Mayor, Councilwoman Bessonelli. Present. Councilman Fitz. Present. Councilman Rossini. Present. Mayor Cook, Here. Mayor Here. Uh, today, I'll ask uh, Councilwoman Fastenelli to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, thank you. And I am going to invite um, three young children who are here which, uh, to help me with the pledge. And we've got Kyle, Daniel, and Stephanie Frank. Okay. Put your hands over your heart. And let's begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. This time I'd like to ask all those in the audience to please silence your cell phones or turn them off if possible. The Villa Park City Council staff welcomes you to this meeting and we encourage your participation. If you wish to address the City Council, please complete and submit a speaker card to the City Clerk before the scheduled meeting time. Speaker cards can be found at the entrance of city council chambers. Speakers will be limited to a time period of five minutes. At this time, we will have uh, members of the public may address the council on any off agenda items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council, providing no action may be taken on off agenda items unless authorized by law. Comments are limited to five minutes per person and 30 minutes for all comments. I have one here from Mark Kulai. Thank you. Mark Kulai, I live at 17872 Helena Circle in the great city of Villa Park. I'm here on behalf of the Villa Park Elementary School Home and School League Executive Board, and we're here on behalf of the parents and the children, really, of Villa Park Elementary School. On our campus is Villa Park's oldest building. It's right here. Uh, it's about 100 years old. The oldest one was built in 1919, and then a smaller building you can't see here was built in 1926. One of the crazy things about this building is that actually haven't been used for student classrooms for 45 years. <laughs> Back in the late 70s, or excuse me, the mid 70s, they were condemned from classroom use. I was a student in 1974, starting in 74, and I've never been able to use these classrooms as a Villa Park Elementary student or a parent. Um, in 1999, they found lead paint peeling from the outside, so the OUSD decided to have it all uh, sandblasted. So now you can see this building here, consider this building here, um, sandblasted 18 years with no weatherproofing. And I want to show you what it really looks like, what a 100-year-old building looks like with several years of known maintenance. In 2006, the OUSD hired an engineering firm to evaluate the structural integrity of the building. The buildings were found unsafe for many reasons, including fire damage, termite damage, water damage, loose roof tiles, severe uh, wall cracks, and more. The engineers of the building said that the risk, the, the risk was not only to the occupants, but to the passerby as well. Well, today that passerby is my third grade son and 600 other students that walk back and forth at Elville Park Elementary. Now, back in the late 90s, Villa Park residents came together with a great idea to restore these old buildings. And it was a fantastic money uh, idea at first, raise some money and restore these buildings. My mother is one of those restoration act activists, and those initial efforts are really to be commended. However, unfortunately, their fundraising efforts were not at all successful. Um, the OUSD estimated that the restoration cost would be $3.5 million, and the restoration advocates couldn't even raise 3% of that with 12, with 12 years of trying. In 2008, recognizing that the fundraising efforts were not going to work, the OUSD, oh, you know, I shouldn't I need to back up here. What the restoration effort activists were able to do was put this building on the National Registry of Historic Places. And while this designation gave it a lot of notoriety, it didn't really help the collections much. In 2008, the OUSD recognized the restoration effort was not going to work, so they sought out a solution. Now, they had to have a very expensive and extensive EIR report because they, it was a registered uh, building, and California law states that. Um, on June 
5th, 2008, the OUSD Board of Trustees had in front of them a resolution to demolish the buildings. That's what was recommended to them. Um, and also part of that 2008 was uh, mitigation measures to help preserve some of the history parts of Phillip Park. The OUSD Board certified that EIR, but on a su subsequent resolution did not do the actual um, demolition. At that time, the, there was a lot of, in the crowd and they demanded to have one more chance for fundraising. Well, and 12 years wasn't enough. Well, here we are now. They've had their wish eight more years later and these buildings, unsafe as ever, have not been addressed. The parents, for the last couple of months, Villa Park parents have been working with the OUSD to finally get this building taken care of. And things are moving great. It's becoming a priority at the district again. So let's bring it why I'm here. I'm here asking you for nothing. <laughs> you see, back in 2008, it was a community concern. In fact, the mayor and another city council member were part of that meeting to save the building. Let's give it one more chance. And the problem is, it's only complicated. It's only made it an issue that's much worse. The building is not ever going to be funded for restoration. The cost would be close to $5 million if that was going to happen, and it's just not going to happen. Yet it's very, very unsafe. Um, as this, uh, and for the past decade, the restoration advocates have raised zero funding. You've not even heard of this, I'm sure most of you. Um, so it's a, it's a big deal. That it's a big deal that on one hand, this building still stands, but nothing's happened. We're asking that the city of Villa Park respect us, the parents of Villa Park Elementary, because we have the skin in the game. It's our children there. <clears throat> respect us and stay out of it and let us work with this, with the OUSD. Now, thank you for your time, and I'd love to answer any questions you have on this matter. I'm not clear, what, what is your objective? For you to do nothing. I mean, <laughs> what do you want to do, what do you want to do with the building? We want to have the building demolished. Okay. Oh, okay. That's what the plan was in 2008. The OUSD had an extensive plan to demolish the building. It's a great plan, actually, but it was activists within the community that said, give us one more chance. I commend you that uh, you're taking this on, because that building, it's a beautiful building but you have to walk around it all day because it's in the middle of that campus. Yeah. And it is, um, I have been fortunate to be in there and it's scary, it's dangerous. It's scary and it sits around a, um, a wire chicken fence which certainly doesn't do anybody any good and I'm, I commend you for opening the discussion to actually Well, it's not just me, USD, it's, it's, you know, it's, to, to tear it I down. Have, I have, for those who are interested, I have Tons of letters from Villa Park Elementary School parents. It's not just me. It's all the parents. Um, it takes a leader to do it, though. Um, well, so thank, thank you, you for that. I, I'm, I'm telling you, <laughs> and one of the parents is a structural engineer that has spent a lot of time looking at the integrity of that building and is very scared as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay. On the new business, our first item of new business is a city manager's appointment and employment contract for Steve Franks. And before we get into this, I just want to say a few words about uh, Steve. Frank has worked for the county for more than 33 years. His most recent serves director of the OC Community Resource. As director, Frank was responsible for overseeing the delivery of services and staff of OC Community Services, OC Public Libraries, OC Parks, and OC Animal Care. He brings solid leadership and insightful ideas on building our infrastructure and economy that will take us into the future. I believe all four of our finalists, candidates, we interviewed would have been capable city managers. Other city council members may speak for themselves, but in my opinion, Steve was and is the best qualified option to bring the current needs to Villa Park. We're very fortunate to have found such a talented and capable leader within our local community. Mr. Franks brings new energy and a fresh perspective at an important time for Villa Park. The council, I look forward to working with Steve. We have a lot of great work to do, and it's clear from Steve's track record and references, he's ready to roll up his sleeves and hit the ground running. So we have any other comments or discussion on the employment contract? Nope. Well, in, uh, in Villa Park, uh, kind of the, the saying goes, you move here, we own you. Yeah, the only way you leave <laughs> is if we carry you out. And uh, hopefully the same thing will work with our new city manager. We hope that you can stay for a long time and do a lot of good work here. Do I hear a motion to approve the contract? Also then? move. Public comment first. Oh. oh, yeah, do we have any one from the public would like to comment on the contract? 
Seeing no one, we will take a motion. I'll make so move. Second. Moved and second. Any further discussion? If not, could we have a uh, roll call? Councilwoman Fascinelli? Yes. Councilman Pitts? Yes. Councilwoman Rossini? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Colicott? Yes. Mayor Nelson? Yes. Five votes. Motion passes. Welcome. Welcome, Frank. Um, our next item for new business is the Summer to Infrastructure Tour. <clears throat> is anyone from the public would like to comment on this item? If not, I'll okay. give it to the city manager. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, on Saturday, January 14th, we did an infrastructure tour, tour with the uh, full council. Uh, a number of members of staff and Ockram and Michelle have uh, put this uh, uh, recap for you up here. And we need to turn some more lights off. The purpose of this infrastructure tour is something that uh, actually the council had on its agenda down the line. It's something that I like to do as an interim uh, to take a look at what needs to be repaired uh, in the city uh, and prepare uh, and be able to provide a summary to the uh, new city manager coming in. And it's great having this on the agenda with Steve in the audience uh, because he can begin to learn about some of the things that uh, some of the challenges are uh, up ahead. Uh, the other purpose is uh, for you to make whatever editorial comments uh, that you want so that we have them in the record in the summary uh, you know, as we uh, uh, go through this. So uh, we'll kick it off. And uh, we took the tour on January the 14th. Uh, we discussed a lot of uh, deficiencies. Uh, council got out and visited the sites. Uh, we had Mike Knowles with us, uh, Akram, um, uh, myself. Uh, and uh, it was uh, uh, an opportunity even to meet with some residents uh, and hear some of their concerns. Uh, the projects that we looked at are kind of the big ones on the capital uh, project list. The Wanda Greenbelt, Villa Park Road medians, Santiago and Patrician, which was a parking issue that seems to have gotten resolved. We'll talk about that in a minute. Surplus land at Santiago and Sycamore. Potential trail at Valley to Cerro Villa. Street project, Taft from Santiago to Lemon. Uh, the Taft trail between Lemon and Center Street and then some the, the worst streets, the residential streets in the poorest condition, we'll talk about those, and then potential storm drain projects. <coughs> On the Wanda Greenbelt, uh, there's $50,000 uh, know, in the budget uh, on this, uh, which isn't gonna do a lot. Uh, and this is a project that apparently has been somewhat controversial in the past. Um, and we, uh, it's, it's one that, with some of the other demands that you have, uh, may get a, a lower priority because of just other demands for your capital improvement uh, dollars. Um, there was some work, uh, Michelle, wasn't there some work, uh, uh, or Mike, was there some work done on redoing the sprinklers or we? No, we got a bid on it. And it was too expensive? Well, they don't act on it. Okay, okay. So um, you can only do a minor amount of work uh, for uh, $50,000. Are there any comments that the council wants to make about this particular uh, project? Uh, I'll make a comment. I don't think that this is a low priority for the same reason when we get to the Villa Park Road medium, that that's a high. The Wanda Green Belt is the barrier, you know, I hate to say it, the barrier between Orange and Villa Park. So as you're driving down that street, you look at that, side and you go, ooh, that's where all those homes are that are a million and a half dollars. Um, I don't think that it needs to, to certainly look like a medium in, in Irvine, but I think we can maybe take it piece by piece. If we can't do the whole thing in one year, we can start to 
divide the, the green belt and make it like a trail. I think I suggested like Anaheim Hills down Santa Ana Canyon Road. You've got old Tustin that has uh, trails with drought tolerant plants and the, and the horse rail and stuff because people do utilize that green belt. And it looks, it would look nice even with minimal planting and just some, you know, some trails that you can walk in there. Because right now it doesn't look like Villa Park. Um, the grass is all weeds. The trees are beautiful. We don't need to take the trees out. The trees are absolutely gorgeous, but I think that we need to, to move it up from being low. We, we also need to, uh, I guess, solicit the help and the, you know, the insight from some of the homeowners that live along that street as well, too, because I think there's some shared responsibility for some of those walls that are, are there and the upkeep of those walls. I mean, I see wooden fences there that you know, have water damage and things like that that, that need repair. That looks really ugly, to be perfectly honest with you. So I, I think that we need to get the homeowners involved as well during, down that path. Anything else? About the I, I would agree that it should not be a low uh, priority because it is where you come right into Villa Park. It's, yep. it's kind of has a negative image for Villa Park if you have a bad place there. My understanding was that they were initially going to automate all the sprinklers there, and I never did see anything from that. It's what it costs to do that. I know it doesn't cost fifty thousand dollars to automate the sprinklers there, yeah, because I think some of the sprinklers were already automated. Thirty-two thousand or something like that, Michelle. Yeah. Seventy-two thousand. Uh, no, 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 no. Thirty-two. 32. Um, that was the original plan: is to get um, automated sprinklers. Yes. Yeah. And I believe I thought the quote was more near fifty fifty thousand because when Jared received it. I think it was brought back, I don't know if it was the CDC, it was brought back to a, a committee and it was kiboshed because $50,000 for rehab on, uh, or just for um, automating the sprinkler system was not what the original um, idea was for. Mike, so, do you remember the bid? It was 32000 to automate Pitchin Ranch Road. Right. Right. And that was and just a piece the of The green bell was... 25 to replace the thousand sprinkler heads. 25,000? Yeah. Yeah. And change so another one pigeon. So. Okay. <clears throat> but that's not necessarily where we're going. It's not just to save water. That's not the purpose. It's to actually right. make the place look nice. So I almost think we have to go back to the drawing table and not talk about putting sprinklers and stuff in. Let's, the original direction, how this started, and it started from CDC when... Um, Councilman Mills and I were on it was we wanted the city manager to take a road trip and go and look at the other cities and what they've done and take a look and see how it is without the grass without the sprinklers and see how the plants that they did plant did thrive and that hasn't occurred so I don't think it should be low but I kind of think we have to kind of start from scratch again also. Mm -hmm. To add to that there was a town hall meeting that, that had an original plan that got a lot of pushback. So the original plan was, nobody wanted the original plan, or the residents did not want the original plan. So I think that- It was, it was almost $400,000. Right, so the, the, the second um, attack at it was, oh, well, maybe we should you know, reduce, because that was when the drought was originally, you know, we gotta cut back on um, our costs. So I think that was where the automated sprinklers was pursued, were pursued. Mm -hmm. So, I think maybe it, was, it sounds like the original that the original something? direction that was given was to go out and look at the other cities, and uh, we had to to look at Tustin, look at Anaheim, and to actually call those cities, and find out from them how they did it, what it cost, and um, that was the original direction, and it got morphed. It got morphed, <clears throat> and we don't need that much grass there. It's not a park. There's a lot of things you can do with that. Any other park, comments? Yeah. Okay. I'm taking copious notes for Steve. <laughs> I just, just, I agree it should not be a low priority. How we do it is a different story, sure. but it should not be a low priority. Okay. It should be something that we should have that's presentable. Get the next one. Villa Park Road Median. Uh, this, there's nothing in the budget for this. This is another entry uh, area. Um, the grass has really deteriorated in this area badly. Um, and it's obviously the visible entry uh, to the city. Um, 
we're throwing out this as a high priority. Um, I agree with you on this high priority. Several years ago, uh, when the Women's League first bought uh, what everyone refers to as the coffins that are down uh, the, the middle of the, the road, it was beautiful. I mean, they were great, they um, were new, we had flowers in them, we had the lemon trees down there. Over the years, they've been hit, they've been broken, they've been faded. Um, I think we've let, you know, we've let them stay there longer than we should, they need to be replaced. Um, I, my understanding is the reason Taft is getting done instead of Villa Park Road, though, is because we did have a shelf-ready plan for Taft and we had grant money. Otherwise, Villa Park Road would be, we'd be using the money to, to do Villa Park Road. Am I correct? Is that correct, Akram? There was no money budgeted for that median at all. No, I, I understand. But when we went, when we had the plan to do Taft, we got a grant. Am I correct? We have, uh, grant, we have grant money for Taft? The Taft was, the grant is for the streets only and does not include any landscaping for the median. That's correct, but we didn't, correct. we didn't get a grant, at, we didn't go after a grant for Villa Park Road. Uh, no, we didn't. So that's why Taft is, yes. well, streets need to be maintained also. But there, there isn't any landscaping on Taft. Uh, well, we can't do Villa Park Road and Taft. We don't have the, the funds to do both of those okay. in the next. But the grant is, was mainly just uh, limited to the street work and does not allow to do any landscaping. However, we were able to convince to build or rebuild the median itself, the curb, in order to raise it, because if we paved uh, additional two inches, the median become flush with the pavement and it become a safety issue. So that's how we were able to convince the, the state and the OCTA to allow us to build a, a rebuild the median, but would not include any landscaping uh, within the median at all in the grant. So you don't have money budgeted here for landscaping or the and, and none uh, on Taft when we get to Taft. Mr. Okay. Okay. okay, any other comments? Well, okay. I again agree. I think this is a high priority because it is against the interest of the city and it looks absolutely horrible. Next. Are there any other, <clears throat> Don, is there any other funds or anything available to us to help with this, to offset this? Well, I think we can talk about funding maybe at, towards the end. Okay. Okay. Because uh, I actually, I even had some discussions with Steve today about, you know, some of his ideas, and he's got some great ideas okay. on, on uh, you know, funding things that he'll, he'll bring to you. Senator Algon and, and Patricia, we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. You already addressed this um, <clears throat> in a parking issue. Uh, just waiting for some red curb and when it stops raining, right, Mike? Tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, so we think that, uh, you know, we, the whole discussion about a stop sign here, uh, it didn't meet the warrants. And uh, so I, we're certainly trying out the, the red curb uh, 40 feet on each, uh, each area. Somebody may have said something because I drove down there the other day and I noticed that the cars had moved further down the hill. <laughs> Without the red curb, huh? Right. <laughs> So uh, the council's dealt with this, and, and I think we've come up with a pretty good solution. Next. Okay, the surplus land at San Diego and Sycamore, and I think uh, Rick is, is Rick here? Yeah, he left. Oh, he left. Okay. Uh, Akram, you want to talk a little bit about what we're finding? Because you uh, found some interesting uh, problems. Uh, uh, originally, we talked about the possibility of uh, selling that uh, surplus land, which is shown in, uh, in yellow uh, or highlighted in yellow uh, to the adjacent property owner. Uh, however, I just want to, uh, right now we're investigating the, the original dedication conditions uh, of that street and the parcel. Uh, from the track map, uh, it shows that it was dedicated as you know, not in fee, uh, therefore in order to vacate the city, vacating any land that is dedicated, not in a fee. That means it's not our, technically it's not, we don't own it. Uh, we cannot sell it to a 
uh, to adjacent property owners and so on, we would have to vacate it and revert it to the original owner, uh, owner or the, uh, the ones who is uh, adjacent to the property. From the track map, the whole uh, portion, the portion <coughs> of uh, Sycamore was a dedicated from the track that <coughs> this property owner is uh, part of it. So it's not dedicated from both sides of the, uh, the properties. It was only dedicated from that track. So now we're uh, checking with the, the legality of that uh, with the, our city attorney. And if that's the case, then uh, it would have to be vacated and given to the adjacent property owner without any, we cannot sell it. However, if we do that, then uh, the property owner would be responsible or we recommend that he'll be responsible for paying for the survey and for the merging of the, the two parcels if the city council decided to vacate that. So, so we've talk, we, I've talked with Todd uh, at length and <coughs> with Akram and we're getting a, a title report to get the, the final look at what this issue is and see if we can find uh, anything that indicates that we have fee simple title to it. We don't think so. Uh, but uh, it'll come back to you on uh, the February 28th agenda. We'll have the answers then and some recommendations you know, for you on. Uh, when you say dedicated, you mean de when, the tra when the developer built that track, they correct. dedicated that particular parcel to the city? That is correct. They dedicated for the purposes of vehicular access. Okay. And if that's the case, then it was not, it didn't say dedicated in fee, just dedicated for uh, vehicular access purposes. Okay. And if that's the case, then technically we cannot sell it. Okay. We're um, limited to what can be used, but we can vacate it and give it back to the uh, property owner in, uh, you know, uh, which is the adjacent property owner. Okay, and just uh, a little, just a thought. This gentleman has taken care of this property for how many years now? Well, he, he didn't yeah. take care of the part that was the city's. He did. Uh, he we, we've been taking care well, of it. Well, we've that. been, hasn't he done maintenance on it also? He, when, when I was here in 2008, this project was being, uh, we were involved in it, and he did some landscaping on the berm, but we did all of the rest of the landscaping, and Mike has had his contractor maintaining it. So okay. uh, one of the things that will be before you is whether or not you want to keep it, renovate it, which it needs, and then continue to maintain it. If what Akram is finding is true, um, we would just you know, uh, vacate it to him, and he would then, uh, the property owner would take it over, and you know he'll landscape it beautifully. When you, when you do that, Akram, can you put contingencies such as they can't build a 10-foot wall all around it or <coughs> all the big ficus trees like we've got some people putting all around their homes where you yes. can't see in? Can you do that? Because yes. We can put certain that restrictions. That seems to be a trend on, right now. We can put certain restrictions to prevent uh, things like that. Okay. That is correct. Thank you. That's an excellent point. I'll make a note of that. Any, uh, any? My question is, if we don't own it, who owns it then? It's, uh, there's a difference between, you know, the ownership. When they say dedicated in fee, then it becomes technically ours, mm -hmm. okay? And we can do whatever we want with it. If it's dedicated as an easement for the purposes of street purposes or sun drain uh, purposes or for, you know, park and so on, we cannot change the usage of that property. And if we do, then technically we have violated the, the conditions that was dedicated for. Therefore, it, it reverts back to the ownership. But who, the, who is the owner then? The owner is the developer who is a uh, track. And since the developer is gone and sold the properties, the parcels, so it becomes the adjacent property owner becomes, uh, have the right to so it. The adjacent property owner becomes the owner then? That is correct. Oh, okay. If we violated our, the conditions of the dedications. 
So we lost thirty thousand dollars. Is what we're talking about, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> about. We think, 20, about yes. we think yeah. it might have been more so, about twenty. In the end, yeah. Yeah. about twenty. Yeah. 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 There, goes, okay. there goes the. Any, any other yeah. comments on this one? Akram, you want to talk about this? Because we didn't spend a lot of time on this one on the tour. Uh, this is the uh, potential of, uh, well, we received uh, some residents who would like to extend the trail that is on, on Valley uh, all the way from Lemon all the way to Cerro Villa. There's a portion of it which is, uh, is there, is dedicated. As, as you see on the top uh, picture, you see the a wooden, uh, uh, you know, fence in there and it stops at the driveway. Now, if you extend it to Cerro Villa, the lower pictures, you see that it would require to build a retaining wall uh, in order to uh, provide a, uh, the trail, a smooth trail, and a continuation <coughs> to that, uh, and so on. So that's, uh, uh, that's the, this, uh, potential trail uh, along uh, valley. About how, how long is that uh, project that you're referring to? Uh, this is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, close to uh, 200 feet, plus or minus. And then at Cerro Villa, then there is a kind of like uh, a flat area where people walk on on the other side, but not on the, on the same side. So if anybody wants that, they would have to cross into the other street to continue walking. And there's trees that need to be removed as well? Uh, this one, there isn't that uh, trees. I think there is maybe one or two trees, two uh, trees. you know, two trees. But otherwise, it is, uh, would require the retaining wall. OK. Any other comments about this? OK, we'll move to the next. Now, this is the big project that's in the budget now. And Akram, you want to chat about the schedule on this? Yeah, this is the uh, Tap Street uh, rehabilitation, and that's the project that we were able to get a, a grant uh, from the uh, state uh, through OCTA. Uh, we received three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, or we'll be receiving it as soon as we finish the project, and uh, we have to match it uh, from general fund. Uh, it is uh, budgeted. It includes the resurfacing of the the street uh, itself, and uh, in some areas, uh, uh, removal and reconstruction. And it also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it would uh, uh, reconstruct the median curb, uh, and for future uh, city landscaping uh, or deciding what to do with the median uh, uh, in that area. And but there is no. Uh, budget and it's not included in the uh, project to do any landscaping on that uh, medium. Uh, do we it have also any idea how much it would cost to do that? Did we look into the landscaping and how much that would cost? Uh, we did not. Okay. We did not. It all depends on what the type of landscape they would like to put in. If they want to put in a uh, lawn or other uh, aesthetics, uh, you know, uh, on that uh, medium. So we did not, you know. We're looking at the, uh, the plans has been approved by the state and ready to be advertised. We should be starting advertising sometimes next month. And we're hoping to start the, uh, uh, the construction right after the school, uh, you know, closes due for summer. So this way we'll minimize the uh, disruption for the school and the traffic uh, along that area. Right? Any questions, questions or comments? On that? Okay, next. Akram, uh, you want to talk about this one? Yes. Uh, at the same time, uh, the city requested to look at the possibility of extending the trail along Taft, uh, you know, on the north side uh, this way to, to connect with the existing uh, uh, trail that is on Lemon uh, and, uh, and Center and so on. 
we looked at, uh, at that. We have a, the, we've uh, hired a consultant and provided us with a design uh, for uh, extending that trail. But as you see in the picture, which is uh, right, the top pictures, there is a lot of trees along that side uh, in order to accommodate a trail uh, uh, on that side, it would require those trees to be removed. Uh, and that's one of the things which is, you know, uh, becomes a question is to value which is, you know, put in a uh, trail or maintain the trees that, uh, you know, as you see, there are big trees and uh, there are good trees uh, in there. The other uh, issue that we had with is uh, a lot of those properties along that side, the, their backyard drain into Taft, into that. You see some holes, you know, uh, without any drain pipes or anything, but there is some uh, drainage uh, coming from those property into that side of the street. And, uh, but we can accommodate it in the design in such a way that we put in a uh, kind of like a, a small channel next to the, uh, the wall that will collect all the water that's coming uh, from that properties and take it all the way to the catch basins uh, at the intersections. Uh, I already envisioned some questions at home. Why would those trees have to be removed? I know the answer, but let's share the answer with, with the public. Uh, in order to, to do that, we need to have a, uh, a wide uh, trail or sidewalk, if you want to call it, that will meet the ADA requirement, uh, which is, needs to be a minimum of uh, uh, 48 inches, uh, a, and you know this, you know, uh, without any uh, any obstructions in that 48, uh, and that's would require it. If we want to maintain them and push the trail into the the street itself, that means we would have to eliminate the bike lane. Uh, in the street, which makes it narrower, and then we'll put in the, uh, jeopardize the safety of the cyclists that, uh, you know, ride on the uh, street. And you see, and you see a lot of pedestrians and also cyclists uh, going to the uh, school uh, in that area. So you don't want to eliminate the bicycle uh, lane, and at the same time, you would like to provide some kind of a safe path for pedestrian to walk on and uh, move it. And that's the only reason that we're re removing the trees. Thank I'm you. I'm certainly glad Thank that you. the council is not in favor of tree removal, having written uh, many tree protection ordinances in my career. Uh, they're just uh, too important. And I sense that this was not a high priority when we were out there and might even be considered to be taken off the capital improvement plan, but that's up to you, obviously, in the future. But there's no money budgeted, and it, it doesn't sound very feasible in, in, in any regard. So. Okay. Any, any other questions or comments about that one? All right. Then we go to the uh, streets that uh, have a – they're in very poor condition. Uh, Akram, you might mention what the numbers uh, yes. for the public's uh, – Edification. Uh, as you all are aware, is uh, as part of the OCTA uh, Major M eligibility, uh, we're required to uh, update our pavement management uh, plan every two years, and it's mainly to uh, every two years for the arterials to be ins uh, inspected, and also we can push the residential every five years. Uh, you know for inspection and to be uh, updating that, that plan uh, uh, and submit it to the OCTA. We did the update and we inspected all the streets, the arterials and the residential uh, last year. And, uh, a, you know, the result, we came out, you know, uh, that we have our overall, it's 86. Uh, 82 or 83 percent the the pavement condition index. Now, what is that p a pavement condition index means? Uh, it is really kind of like a giving grade uh, from zero to 100. 
uh, like uh, schools. Uh, now, from zero to 40, that means the street in a very, very poor conditions, and there's no uh, hope for it. It needs to be re completely reconstructed. Then the second uh, level is 41 to 60, uh, which is poor, in a poor condition, and that requires a, uh, you know, some structure, uh, you know, uh, rehabilitation of the pavement itself. There's a lot of uh, failures and so on, and it requires a either rehabilitation or reconstruction in some uh, section. Then we go into another level, which is 61 to 75. It's kind of like a fair condition. Uh, it's still, you know, the there are some defects in it. There's some cracks. There's some, you know, uh, patching, but it's still structurally, uh, you know, to some degree, there is stability, but it's deficient, okay? And also would require uh, a maintenance and immediate maintenance or repair. Then we come in in the good uh, uh, portion, which is, is 76 to 85. That's the pavement is in a good condition. You might see some cracking in it uh, in there, but it is uh, still structurally sound, and it requires either a crack ceiling and a slurry seal and so on to prevent it from uh, deteriorating uh, and falling down into a lower section. Then 86 to 100, that's mean the street is in an excellent condition or very good condition and does not really require uh, much uh, of rehabilitation. Uh, overall, uh, the city's PCI or the pavement condition index uh, in the city is 83%, uh, 83 <coughs> out of 100. Uh, however, the there are several streets uh, that fall down into the uh, poor and poor uh, and poor conditions, and we've listed them in here, and we went uh, drove on those streets, and uh, uh, which that means in the next round of uh, you know street projects, we need to look into them and see if we need to take care of them right away. And, but we got to make sure to, to verify if, if we have any underground utilities uh, projects that's in the near future that needs to be uh, constructed on those streets, then we would have to coordinate you know, the scheduling of the streets projects with the underground utilities uh, projects. And uh, those listed uh, up, it's Lee Circle, uh, we got 50. Uh, Montana Circle, uh, Mesa <coughs> Drive, and the portion of Mesa Drive from Mesa to Villa uh, Isle, and uh, Park uh, Villa Place. Uh, those are below 60 in the 50s. And then we go into the 60, that's Hidden Valley, Fernando Circle, <coughs> Francisco Drive, and uh, the, those are in the 60s, but below the 65, which is the uh, as I mentioned, is the, uh, you know, fair condition is that. And then Durfee Circle, Loma, and James Circle, those are all below the 70, uh, which is, they're fair, but still uh, they need some uh, improvement that needs to be done. You know. Akram, the ones that are on our current list for improvement, are those in worse shape than these? <laughs> Well, uh, here's the thing also sometimes you look at is there are streets which is in a bad shape that requires reconstruction. Uh -huh. And there is a street that is, you know, at the uh, point where if you don't do anything with it right now, it's going to fall into the reconstruction. Is it better to put the money to save this street that's right at the edge and pave it before it goes into complete reconstruction. Right. So that is because the repaving, uh, for example, it costs a dollar, the reconstruction is gonna cost four to five dollars. So you might invest of one dollar to uh, improve one street and maintain it versus coming the next year or the year after 
and do a street that is need to be reconstructed. The reason I asked the question is do we need to prioritize these streets over other streets that we've got set for improvements or okay. is this something you believe that's over and above that? Well, it's a, the pavement management kind of give us a, uh, one of the things which we uh, does is uh, we go and put in a certain budget and it kind of like prioritize the streets that needs to be taken care of. And it's take in consideration some of those PCI plus also, uh, you know, that could be adjusted depending on what other underground utilities projects that we're doing. So, for example, if we're doing a, uh, a, a sewer, a sewer project, project that's, let's say, on Loma, mm -hmm. then we would do that street <coughs> at the same time that we're doing the stone drain. You know, if, for example, we're not going a, doing a sewer project or stone drain till two years from now on James, then it becomes a question is, do we need to pave this street now or should we delay it and do it with the utilities or maybe move up the utility project in order to do the street project? So those are becomes a engineering judgment and city judgment to decide then what is the priority, move it up and down accordingly. And your and grant funding, we'll, you know, is also, uh, you know, drives a lot of this. And they're, the grantors are much more interested in major thoroughfare streets than they are in these kinds of streets. So. I'd like to, to add to this. When we went on this uh, road tour of the streets, I got a better understanding of what these numbers are. And these numbers aren't universal because OCTA doesn't use these numbers anymore in their current rating, if I remember correctly, because we, we asked them. Um, for the current. So when I looked at 50 and 53, like from Montana, when we drove down Montana, Montana, the street was fair until you got to the end of the cul-de-sac. You got to the end of the cul-de-sac, you knew why it was 53. But it was rated because of that end of the cul-de-sac. Now, I'm going to reverse that and say, why is the end of the street 53? Well, over the last six years, the construction vehicles that have gone down to that part of the street and the weight, because there have been several homes that have been completely remodeled, added to that. So we have that problem right now going on on Abbott. I'm just giving you examples of, of homes. So we have to be careful that we're not going to go in and redo Montana today. It's a, you know, it's a, a mouse and, you know, chasing the mouse game here, do Montana, and then we turn around and we have a home sold over there, and we have two years worth of construction sitting on that exact same spot. So I don't know how we prioritize that. Um, be, mm. And in addition to that, we've got all these trucks. I'm throwing this out. Is there a fee? I mean, do we have to, I hate to say this, increase the fee for these trucks coming on the street since they're damaging some of these streets? I don't know. It's just a, something to talk about. Yeah, and part of the uh, part of the load on the streets that's causing the damage, particularly in the uh, cul-de-sacs, are the trash trucks. We have three trash trucks coming every week to all of our neighborhoods. Uh, one thing we uh, did do uh, last year in our budget was we included some money for uh, just uh, spot street repair where there was uh, physical deterioration. Dodson was one of the streets that uh, was affected by that, where they had some uh, uh, large areas that were deteriorated, perhaps like the end of Montana, where we went and we fixed those. I'm sure that will improve the PCI rating of that street. Mm -hmm. um, you know, granted, ideally, you'd want to pave the whole street, make it all look pretty, but uh, by correcting the structural deficiencies, we buy ourselves some more time and some more life, and you can come back and. Uh, do a, uh, an overlay over that at some later date when we have the funds. So that's something we can look at or should be looking at in terms of uh, situations like the end of Montana. But uh, Lee Street, uh, I, th I think when we went out there and visited it, uh, uh, Akram, your recommendation was the only repair that would be suitable for that would be a total removal and repaving that area. Oh yeah, Lee Street was, mm -hmm. Lee Street was the worst Disaster. street that we drove on. Bad. Yeah. There's no Fortunately, it's not a very long street. <laughs> Any other comments? Okay. Last but not least, 
the potential storm drain projects and uh, of course the collapse of the storm drain at uh, Mesa and Henderson. Um, and Akram, you want to talk about where we are without going, well, you've done your estimates uh, of the permanent cost. Okay. And we've gotten our uh, initial cost from the county for their help to us, which actually we were surprised it wasn't higher than it was. So there's a lot going on. You're going to be talking about this project, I think, so. at each of your council meetings for an, a number of months. Okay, it's the next. Uh, yeah. okay. okay, that's it. As everybody is aware, we had a, uh, a major stone drain, 96 inch uh, uh, corrugated uh, metal pipe uh, collapsed uh, during the last uh, storm. And uh, uh, we were able to uh, staff and with the help of the council members to get the county uh, to come in and assist us in removing the collapsed pipe uh, uh, within the a private easement uh, uh, in a residence, uh, private uh, residence. Uh, it was removed and uh, a natural ditch was created in order to maintain the flow of, uh, uh, of water from one side uh, uh, of the property to the other side uh, to the uh, existing uh, pipe that goes underneath Mesa. Uh, now, it is 96 inch uh, corrugated pipe that was, uh, you know, collapsed and then that is connected to a, a concrete pipe uh, under Mesa Street itself. The, so far, we've tried to estimate how much uh, cost that uh, it cost us to repair, uh, I think approximately 60 plus or minus 60 to $70,000 uh, so far the temporary uh, repair uh, that included removal of the existing trees and making it, uh, uh, you know, uh, and removing the pipe uh, by the county and uh, putting a uh, what it's called the muscle wall to protect the existing house uh, in case of any uh, flooding that could occur. Uh, luckily, it's, uh, uh, there was no, you know, uh, no floods or any damage to the house itself and so on. Uh, now, the, the county uh, is declared or requested from the governor to declare Orange County as a, an emergency, uh, a state of emergency. And with that, we've, uh, you know, uh, to assist for having uh, some federal uh, or emergency funds to come in to the, to the county to uh, cover some of those uh, uh, damages that uh, occur from the storm. The city has submitted uh, an estimate of uh, the replacement of a, you know, uh, storm drain within that area uh, from the natural uh, uh, flow or uh, canyon all the way to <clears> Mesa <throat> and we've estimated that could be around six, uh, 600000 or 600 to $700,000 uh, including you know all the uh, work that's necessary to also re regrade the property that's inside and put it in a condition that is going to be an acceptable. Let me stop you right there, Akram. Yeah. Um, we haven't selected any particular uh, repair. Uh, this is probably the Cadillac. Uh, if you wanted to do a Cadillac repair on this, this is what it would cost. There are other uh, satisfactory, uh, appear to be satisfactory alternatives to uh, uh, address this situation that we're still evaluating. We and the council has not selected an alternative as, as of this time. That is correct. So that is correct. This, this is, is just a, one of the alternatives that is being considered. Yeah, this is the estimate that we are submitted to the, uh, to the county so they can submit it to the, uh, to the state. And we don't want to short ourselves for any reason. We don't want to put in the cheapest, uh, uh, you know, design or the cheapest uh, uh, option. So we need to put in what is the maximum uh, possible 
uh, solution. And the, the higher cost, the better. So this way, if yeah, we get up Yeah, I just want to make sure that that's clear, that we're not, we haven't selected this. That is, we have not done any design, uh, but we did an estimate. And as I said, we submitted that. So this way, if the governor did declare a state of emergency and we get funds, at least we get funds for that, our estimate, rather than if we put in, for example, 300, and then they approve it for 300, and if the city council decided to do another alternative and it becomes higher, it becomes from our city pockets. And we're expecting yeah. visitors, I think, from the county on Thursday or uh, Friday of this week. That is correct. That want to look at this situation. So uh, have we submitted the request? Have we submitted documents? Yes. Yes. We have. Yes. yes. Okay. And how, how long before it was a very know? tight time constraint. <laughs> yes. And very can I tight. ask the storm drain? What material would, in that, what material is the storm drain made out of? The, the collapsed pipe, it is a corrugated metal pipe. Right, and what are, what are we at, what's the Cadillac offer? <laughs> the Cadillac <laughs> offer is to put in a concrete. Concrete. Yes. Uh, again, the reason, let we me, have not designed it. No, I understand. No the design, reason I ask, coming yes. from a non-engineering standpoint, is that when uh, the valley storm drain collapsed, we put in a plastic. Yeah, it, Pipe, am I correct? That's uh, and that, at least that's what the that's what the um, agenda says back in 2010. Before my time, so and, <laughs> before yeah, my time I've, too. I've, but that's why when that did collapse, we did put in the plastic in, in lieu of reinforced concrete pipe. We put in a plastic storm drain pipe. Yeah, a, a plastic pipe can be utilized for uh, uh, for storm drain. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is a. Uh, certain uh, pipes that it be allowed. The HDP, uh, yeah. Okay. But again, we have not designed it yet. Sure. We don't have a, a approved, uh, you we, know. Uh, we don't. I think yeah. in the future, just keep this in mind that if it's when it's brought to us, I'd like to know what our storm drains are made of. If we have some plastic, we have some corrugated. It, I think that we need to know what they are. Well, yeah, and that's part of what the, uh, the storm master drain ma master yeah. plan yeah. is uh, doing, is they're going out and looking at uh, trying to identify where all of, our, all of our storm drain system consists of, what the diameters are, what the conditions are, and also what they're made of. Yeah, so. I've read all, I actually read all the reports that updates, and I didn't get any of that, but our, our own records give you a wealth of knowledge even without them. So that's, that's why I went back to. But the mayor pro tem is cor correcting the master plan is moving their back you know, on the new schedule. And they've been sending, and I just sent you a new right. weekly update today. Uh, and so uh, when, when do we expect to have the master plan uh, draft? Uh, still they're gonna, it'll be in, uh, in March. Okay. March, April, yeah, end of March, okay. April. So Steve can take note of that. Yes. I know. Uh, this is uh, some of the pictures Akram? of. Uh, Akram? Akram? Yes. Question. How long does it typically take by the time you submit the paperwork to the, to the county to hear back whether or not funds are available, that type of thing? Well, it's still, that's unknown because since it's not, it hasn't been declared as a state of emergency. Okay. So the county is trying to, I guess, to convince the state uh, to do that. That's why it was a, they wanted the estimate and so on within yesterday. Yeah, uh, so Michelle, how, <laughs> how quick was that, uh, that time frame? Um, Five days? Two hours. <laughs> yeah, it, we got the email on a Monday afternoon and it was due Tuesday morning. Yeah, so, but don't plan to go to the bank yet. No, 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 no. Just, yeah. just curious about the process and how long it takes to do these things and. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it varies. It varies. And for the benefit of the council, I had a conversation with Don today, and I asked him to call JPIA be to look at what coverage we have, what's covered, what's not, because just because it was a storm drain, uh, she does have personal property that was affected. We do have the backyard, and and he has a call in. And, and the some executive questions. director has gotten back to me and uh, and basically said, "I'll get back to you." Right. I figured that. <laughs> That's okay. But the conversation's opened up. So we've opened the yes. conversation. Yeah, exactly. And just want to, uh, these are pictures of uh, the, storm, the Sunday storm drain. Uh, 
uh, how the water is flowing into the, uh, the backyard, the one on the right, that's where the uh, channel, uh, natural channel, channel uh, in place of the pipe, the collapsed pipe. And the one on the left, it is in the natural creek uh, before it enters the uh, private property. Okay, any other comments? Uh, if you go back to the previous slide. Okay. Uh, if you look up, this is looking uh, upstream from the uh, area that um, was, uh, where the channel was put into a uh, eight foot diameter corrugated metal pipe. <clears throat> you can see that that's a natural swale and uh, we believe that that's what the condition of this, uh, the channel was where the uh, corrugated metal pipe uh, was installed prior to the, uh, the installation of the culvert. Um, so, uh, you know, we, what, we've, uh, what the, we believe that uh, somebody or the developer of that property took the uh, flow from that uh, natural storm drain or natural channel and put it into a culvert to go through this property. Other comments? Long, oh, yeah, look, question, another question. How long can we leave this like this before we have to physically do something with it? That's, um, we're talking with council. Okay. Yeah, that's really a legal question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we can go on beyond this then to the next slide after this. This is, yeah, the next yeah, slide, next the slide. slide before. Okay, talk about some conclusions here. Uh, in the my opinion and in the interim city manager's opinion, the highest priority in the capital projects is the um, Mason Henderson uh, storm drain. And again, we don't know exactly what the cost is, but it could be, uh, you know, very significant. It's come out of, you know, it just uh, hit the budget uh, because of the rain and because of the storm. Um, the, since the city incorporated, it's followed a policy of pay as you go for everything, uh, which it's to be commended for. Uh, but um, I'm recommending that you think about reconsidering and entertain a capital project financing program for the following reasons. One, the city is 55 years old and much of the infrastructure is older. The collapse of the connector uh, storm drain is testimony to the fact that the city's infrastructure needs repairing and upgrading and you're gonna have a master plan that's gonna probably bring a lot more th things to your attention. Um, and, uh, and that'll be projects that you can't possibly afford in, in one year. Economies of scale can be achieved by doing larger projects. Um, and I just give the, the kind of simplistic example of when you're working on your kitchen, you don't, and you want to redo the kitchen, you don't do the, the oven this year and the dishwasher next year and the stove the following year. You try to lump as much of these projects together as you can. And there's a lot of obvious financial reasons for doing that. Matching grant funds, and certainly have been my experience, uh, are much more available for larger projects. So you're gonna get more attention uh, uh, for that. The city should uh, pursue more discretionary funding. I'm really surprised that we haven't been knocking on the supervisor's door more. As I told you in 2008 when I was here, we knocked on uh, Supervisor Campbell's door, uh, the, count, the city was getting ready to use its, its uh, reserves to fix the cannon uh, slide. We said, no, 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 no. We used um, gas tax money and um, went to the supervisor and he matched it. And so it was six to $700,000 and we got 350000 from him. Uh, uh, we haven't been knocking on, on that door as much as maybe we should. Um, city reserves, uh, in my opinion, should not be reduced for capital projects because they pr are, exist to protect the general fund from a majority of both anticipated and unanticipated fiscal matters that happen. So 
You've got a capital improvement budget for FY 16, 17 of a million and a half. The seven year capital improvement budget is six and a half million nearly. And this uh, emergency <coughs> storm drain issue, you know, pick a number. Uh, so my recommendations are that you've given us your, your, your comments. Um, I'm going to pass this on to Steve and discuss it uh, with him. And I think it's really great that he's here tonight and being able to hear your comments and seeing the things and your concerns. Um, we want to incorporate these uh, into the uh, budget planning process that will be getting underway here pretty soon. And then the last uh, which may be somewhat controversial, but is to direct the city's finance director to seek financial proposals from highly qualified firms for the city council's consideration. Not that you're making a final decision or anything like that. To handle larger scale capital improvement uh, uh, projects and pay for it over a period of time. Anyway, that's the end of my report, Ockham's report and Michelle's report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any comment from the public? Uh, I like your progressive thinking of looking for financial proposals, but I think that before we take any staff's time or go after that, we need to get that report back and see what we're looking at. Um, because that, you know, the city's never borrowed money before. Um, and that would be a big change. So to do that, I think we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the residents to find out what we're looking at. We know it's <clears> big, but we need to find out what we're looking at and prioritize it. And at that point, discuss doing that. Um, until then, I think it, we're just you're wasting Michelle's time. Yes. Um, and I think there are some other in, in, uh, intermediate steps like uh, developing asset management plans so that uh, as we develop, you know, if we go for a uh, capital bond bonding um, uh, program that uh, once we improve all these facilities that we have a, a plan in place to, to maintain all of these facilities so that they don't fall into disrepair in another, you know, couple of decades. Uh, one other comment I'd like to add is uh, about a year ago, I worked with the city manager and we submitted a uh, request for uh, a major flood uh, project with, to the uh, county flood control district. Now this storm drain uh, that goes through this pipe that collapsed is part, um, uh, that reach is part of a flood hazard area that goes through par a portion of Villa Park and actually results in flood hazards to both uh, Villa Park High School and Sarah Villa Middle School. Um, a number of our residents along that flood hazard way uh, pay quite significant flood hazard insurance every year. Um, I was surprised to learn that. I mean, I've lived in this uh, city for 35 years and was not, uh, until a couple years ago, was not aware that any of our residents were having to pay flood, in, uh, flood hazard insurance. But anyway, they are. And uh, so we put a uh, request in for a uh, project. Um, unfortunately, it was uh, submitted late and uh, the, uh, we got the, uh, the school district, the superintendent of the school district, to submit a letter uh, as a co-applicant uh, to the flood control district. But I think that's something we should go back and revisit with the county, and particularly with the Todd Spitzer's office, the chairman of the Board of Supervisors, that, hey, we, we came to you a year ago, identified that we have a flood hazard area that, was div um, that has been mapped by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And uh, here we've now got a failure of a portion of that area. Uh, this needs to be fixed. And um, uh, we all pay in Villa Park, pay for uh, flood control district taxes. Uh, we've been paying for them since the district, it was, the flood control district was established back in the 30s. Uh, maybe it's time for the county to step up and uh, provide us with a project to deal with the flood hazard in our city. So if we could add that onto the hopper of uh, measures for us to take. That may come back to bite us, though, because um, for the few residents that pay the flood insurance, and it gets and we start, you know, telling the county, hey, we're, we are in a flood zone. That could lead to 
2,000 homes being required to have flood insurance? No, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has already mapped the flood hazard zone in, uh, that goes through Villa Park. Because not that's everyone a, that, does pay flood insurance. Not now. everybody does, but yeah. they've identified those that are in the flood hazard, uh, the flood zone that are, has been mapped by FEMA, uh, and that's publicly available information. Uh, they do pay flood insurance. Yeah. Uh, those of us that are not in the flood hazard area do not and would not be required to. What a project would do is if, a, uh, if the, the, the purpose of the project would be to eliminate the flood hazard and our residents that are currently paying flood hazard insurance would no longer be required to pay flood hazard insurance. And better yet, um, we would be protected from flooding. And so would the, those two schools be protected from flo uh, flooding. So it's, it's really something that would be a be, uh, an overall benefit uh, and with no negative to our city. Okay, do we have any comments from the public on the infrastructure tour? No one? We'll bring it back to council. I guess we have two recommendations, if I recall, from staff. You, you lumped a one and three into one. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, in the report, I have four recommendations. I mean, obviously, one, uh, uh, we, we want to add your editorial comments into the infrastructure summary and, uh, and direct me to review it with the, with new, the city manager new city manager and direct uh, the staff to incorporate these projects in the budget planning process. And then I'm, I'm hearing that, uh, number four, you want to defer for a while. Well, I'll take these one at a time. I guess adding editorial comments, you're going to do that. So I don't guess we have to direct you to do that. Well, uh, yeah, I guess one of the editorial comments would be to include the um, application for a, uh, uh, a flood project with the flood control district. Right. But also in the uh, description of the uh, issue uh, with the collapsed storm drain that we, we clear, clearly be identified that this is just one of, uh, al one of the alternatives that we're uh, currently evaluating, we're evaluating others, and there are other uh, legal engineering issues that need to be resolved. Yeah. This is now an in-house working document. Okay. Now I'll take the second one. Do I have a motion to direct the uh, interim city manager to review this document and the summary with the new city manager? I'll so moved. Moved. I'll second. Moved and second. You can just say so directed. Yeah. So directed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, direct staff to incorporate the project in the budget planning process. So I, I would like to comment on this. I'd like to actually bring this back to a regular council meeting. Um, most of the residents didn't know we were having a council meeting today. And, you know, we know that our council meeting is on the fourth Tuesday of the month, and that's what it is. And I think that if we put it on a regular council meeting, people would have the opportunity to look at the agenda, have the opportunity to come here and speak. They can see our comments that we made, and, you know, it's only two weeks away, but they'll be able to see the video and what we've done. Maybe they can come back and add something to this before we actually direct staff to, to do something. Now, this is a special, it's not a special, but an adjourned meeting um, for the primary purpose of hiring the city manager. So I hate having such a large document, uh, working document being incorporated into the city right now. Or you could, uh, you know, if you want to bring it back on the 28th uh, and continue it to the 28th, that's fine. It's just, it's very, this is important. It's good. There's nothing bad here. I just want to give the, the public the opportunity to be able to come to the council meeting and talk about this and look, and look at it and offer their opinions to us. Well, what I see is asking staff to incorporate these projects into the budget planning process, and the public will have an ample opportunity during the budget planning process to comment on these issues. Because you just said, including the budget planning process, we're not making a decision tonight to include any of these <coughs> in the budget, just including the budget planning process, as I understand it. Yeah, and, and, um, and you'll be talking about these capital projects, and you can certainly uh, bring the slide presentation back as nope. you're discussing the capital projects. Uh, we, have, we have two or three budget planning sessions set out for, for the year to talk about these. Is the, is the reports and the things that we've seen, is this all going to be put on the website for people to pull down review, including the presentation tonight, that kind of stuff? The, yeah, is it on there now? Or? Uh, it's on there with, yeah. Not but, the, but, the, but they don't do that. But we can problem. Yeah, they, do, you know, they don't look at it. I mean, we know our residents. If we try 
there's no reason to, they want to see it. They want to see it up front. They want to see it on a regular agenda. They want the opportunity. I mean, it's just a little more. Two weeks isn't going to make a difference. I, I don't see the difference. I just see that this is a budget planning process. We're going to bring these projects back time and time again during the budget process, have ample opportunity to take a look at them then. So why not just direct them to put them into the plan, budget planning process tonight? What's the difference in three weeks from now? I would agree with uh, our, our mayor on that. I think we should uh, start the ball rolling on that. We can revisit things as, as they uh, come about. Um, this is a, a working document of sorts. Correct me if I'm wrong. So we've directed staff on the first two items. Do I have a motion to direct staff on the third item? I'll move. Make a second? I'll second it then. Councilwoman Fascinelli? No. Councilman Pitts? No. Councilman Rossini? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Colicott? Yes. Mayor Nelson? Yes. <coughs> Now, the last one is direct the city finance director to additional seek finance proposal from highly qualified firm for the city council consideration of larger scale capital improvement project financing. What's your pleasure with this one? Well, I thought, you know, maybe we would uh, kind of delay this for the time being until we understood better what the, the projects were and the cost potentially associated with it and that kind of stuff. That, until we know, there's no sense in really reaching out and doing anything? Yeah, I would agree, 100%. Would agree. Okay. okay. Let's know what we're dealing with. However, um, you know, perhaps uh, during our budget uh, session, if uh, uh, we could get some information about, uh, you know, bond financing and what it all entails and the costs and so forth, the, the current costs and so forth, just to educate this, the council on this alternative so that... Uh, as we go further, if we evaluate, we can evaluate this with a more informed perspective. And also potential grants and grant information, anything mm -hmm. like that that's available to us and resources to help with the grant writing and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need a vote on this. I think it's quite clear. The council direction on this one. <coughs> okay. We understand the direction. <laughs> okay. Uh, so is there any further discussion? If not, our next item of new business is the consideration of appointing a representative from Neighborhood Watch to the Law Enforcement Advisory Committee. Is there anyone from the public that would like to comment on this item? If not, I'll bring it back to council. I, I, I oh, okay. have a question as to why this is on. I mean, what, wasn't there a directive some time ago that this should be part of it? Why is this? I'm this confused. actually doesn't need to be appointed. We actually have a, a letter that was sent to us from Wayne and Mary Sizzell, the Villa Park Watch Coordinators, that explained it quite nicely. It was in everyone's mailbox. Um, anybody from the Neighborhood Watch, you just need to have, you know, they're invited to come. And she clearly says that. She does, they don't want to be appointed. They're not supposed to be appointed. Um, that's not how it was set up, but I like that we did put this resolution back in here because there is a few things if we're going to look at it because it, what it says here, mm -hmm. the members that hold the position, let's see, what do we have here? Um, two city council members, neighborhood watch representatives, and it doesn't say anything about them being appointed. They don't want to be appointed. They want to be independent. So why would we want to do that? We might, it might, we might want to invite other homeowner watch captains to come in. So I'm sure everyone saw this. There's an um, item here on section five though of this. Let's see, cause that's in section two, section three, section four, and section five that says, uh, every six months the committee shall provide the city council a financial report of costs incurred by the sheriff's department for their participation. Um, I'd like to request that that be submitted to council at the next meeting if they can get that. If not, it could be in March, cause that's never been presented. Did everyone get the memo from Mrs. Yes, yes, okay. I, I agree. They said they didn't yeah. want to be appointed. Yeah. So I didn't, it's not necessary. I don't know why we had this on here. They don't want to be appointed. They, they say they're an independent group. 
with no no control by the city. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, probably. <laughs> yeah. So. So what do you want to do? So I guess we we can just skip this. We don't have to appoint anyone. If they they don't want to be appointed, we shouldn't appoint them, should we? Yeah, I'm fine with that myself. Yeah, it was just confusing when I read the. So your interim was confused. Yeah. And, Put this on. He's confused. He saw that the neighborhood watch was on the yeah. on the committee, but they were never appointed to the right. committee. Right. So we just wanted to. But know, that's because they never it, wanted to be appointed. Make sure the council was in agreement with the confusing resolution. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're all in agreement that they should not be appointed. No. No. Nope. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and I will check with uh, Lieutenant uh, Puckett. Uh, I'm. I would of, be surprised if they charge anything. One of the, one of the concerns we had was that it wasn't a cost on money; it was a cost on their time. Because in the end, it is about their time when the contracts come up for renewal. So we wanted, when we first started this, to see how much time the sheriffs were putting in to our committees, and that's why that was put in there. Oh. So there was a reason. For I that. would be surprised if they charge anything. Well, it's, uh, not, it's, it's it's my understanding that it's just part of the contract. It's a service that they provide. Yeah as a courtesy as they provide so many other services as a courtesy yeah. um, but if uh, councilwoman would uh, we'll, like we'll, that we'll sort check of it out. Yeah, well, it's I in mean, the resolution it, it, that's it's a, what we passed. it's a simple well, uh, yeah. simple matter of, of allotting for their time and uh, for the uh, nominal price of probably zero dollars and zero cents but it's good to yeah, because, keep, keep uh, track of what they're providing the city gets so many uh, free nothing's free it all comes up at renewal well I understand <laughs> but you do very well with the sheriff's department yeah. but we well, put I'll, the I'll council you got, you put got, it in the Leak resolution we'll though. Sure. so if, if we're not and going to abide by our resolutions we'll verify it yeah all right. we'll verify it needs it. to be present okay any anything else Anything else from the public? It, anything else from the council? No. If not, I will adjourn uh, a meeting to our next regular scheduled meeting on February the 28th at 6.30 p.m. And Mr. Mayor, we have cake for everybody that says, Welcome Steve, on the cake. Great. <laughs> okay. Bye.